The prolonged and drawn-out struggle that unfolded between the nations of England and France is still regarded as a magnificent and illustrious chapter in the annals of the Age of Chivalry. The monikers of such intrepid and high-minded champions as Jan II, known by the sobriquet Le Minger Boussicault, or John Chandos, continue to resonate in the present day. Moreover, their conduct towards those they had vanquished was universally held in high esteem and regarded with great respect. Nevertheless, concurrently, the conflict known as the Hundred Years' War is recalled by those who lived through it as also being associated with individuals of lesser virtue and nobility. Notably, the practice of bartering captured knights escalated to levels never before seen. The initial and most forceful catalyst for the emergence of what could be described as a marketplace for the bargaining and sale of nobility for their release against sums of money was the Battle of Cressy, which occurred in the year 1346. The disastrous and calamitous defeat suffered by the French forces culminated in the British capturing hundreds upon hundreds of enemy knights. The sheer number of captives was so great that the victors, without a shred of mercy, put to death those who were gravely wounded, as they were not inclined to allocate resources for their medical treatment or their transportation. Typically, a captive of noble birth would become the spoils not of a common foot soldier, but rather of a fellow nobleman. In this system, there was no established or universally accepted tax or fixed amount for the release of a prisoner. The sum to be paid for each individual captive was arrived at by agreement between the parties involved. It did not take long for brokers and intermediaries to make their appearance in the English encampment, individuals who were prepared to offer immediate payment for a prisoner of particularly high value, albeit sometimes the amount tendered was not especially large. Consequently, some French captives were transferred between multiple owners before reaching their final destination. However, the ultimate profit yielded from such transactions could be quite substantial. For instance, Sir Thomas Holland was remunerated with the sum of 80,000 florins for the release of the Count D, and the aggregate revenue generated from the sale of the French captives taken at Cressy brought the British a total of 340,000 livres. This amount was on a par with the annual budget of the entire kingdom. There were, however, certain peculiar and unusual predicaments that arose. For example, the entitlement to the ransom money could be claimed by several soldiers simultaneously. In such scenarios, the ensuing dispute sometimes languished unresolved for years on end. One particular case involved John of Arundel and Charles of Navarre, who engaged in protracted legal wrangling over which one of them had actually captured Olivier Duchclin. In this instance, it was not so much the monetary gain, but rather the prestige that was at stake. After all, Olivier was the sibling of the renowned French Connetable Bertrand Duchclin. In such complex situations, it often fell upon the king to render the final judgment. However, preferring not to engender resentment among his subjects, he would frequently postpone his decision in the hope that the matter would somehow resolve itself in due course. Incidentally, Bertrand Duchclin himself earned fame not solely on account of his martial exploits, but also because he, too, became a pawn in these negotiations. His leadership skills were deemed so invaluable that the funds for his liberation were furnished personally by the French King Charles V. And such an arrangement had to be made not once, but twice. First in the year 1364 following the battle at Or, and then again in 1367 after the conflict at Naira. The English laid claim to their most significant prize in the year 1356 after their victory at the Battle of Poitiers. Another devastating loss for the French culminated in the capture of their monarch, King John II, who was known as the Good. However, the sum agreed upon for his ransom was never fully paid. France, beleaguered and bloodied, simply could not amass the fantastical sum of 3 million gold ECU required for his release. Despite this, a respectable income was secured by the more rank-and-file knights. After all, in addition to the French king, the captives included 17 dukes, 13 counts, 5 viscounts, and approximately 100 noblemen of lesser stature. Naturally, the English monarchs were not inclined to allow such a considerable sum of money, generated from the business of holding captives, to bypass the royal treasury. King Henry V, in particular, promulgated a special edict in which he sought to regulate the distribution of the proceeds. It was decreed that all soldiers, 
ranging from knights and captains to the most humble of squires and archers, were mandated to honestly pay to the crown one-third of all earnings that they accrued during the wartime period. However, there were occasions when misfortune struck. Thus, in the year 1385, the Battle of Algebarota resulted in a victory for the Portuguese monarch João I. His forces, which included a sizable contingent of Englishmen, defeated the army led by Juan I of Castile, which was composed largely of French combatants. The victors were left with a rich bounty in the form of hundreds of noble prisoners. It was estimated by some that the ransoms for these captives could potentially yield a profit of 400,000 francs. Yet, to the profound disappointment of the English, nearly all of the unfortunate prisoners ultimately had to be put to death, as there were insufficient provisions to sustain them. But the principal drama was still to unfold, and once again, the fate of the noble captives would be determined by a whimsical twist of fate. In the year 1415, the celebrated Battle of Agincourt took place. The weary and half-famished English troops, led by Henry V, faced off against a vastly superior force that represented the very elite of French knighthood. The engagement proceeded in a manner that had become all too familiar. The French advanced upon the hill where the English archers had entrenched themselves. This only served to ensure that with each passing hour, Henry V's wagon train swelled with new prisoners clad in sumptuous armor. The Battle of Agincourt might well have gone down in history for the record-breaking, sums that could have been amassed from the sale of these high-ranking captives to their anxious relatives. But this opportunity was squandered by an assault on the convoy carried out by local peasants, who were rallied by their feudal lord bearing the all-too-apt surname of Diagencourt. When Henry V received word of the attack on his inadequately defended encampment, he was seized by grave concern. Firstly, the wagon train contained the entirety of the royal treasury and the monarch's own personal crown. Secondly, should the peasants succeed in liberating the thousand-bound knights, the English forces would find themselves encircled and trapped. The king wavered for a time, but as another onslaught by the French knights commenced, he issued one of the most heinous commands in the annals of military history. He ordered that the prisoners be put to death. The English knights, however, refused to execute this command. They contended that to kill an unarmed man was antithetical to the honor that nobility was bound to uphold. But in truth, they were simply loath to forfeit such lucrative plunder. As a consequence, Henry V dispatched 200 common foot soldiers to the rear, who then assumed the grim role of executioners. They dispatched the defenseless knights with a barbarity akin to slaughtering livestock. This horrific act of mass murder cast an indelible and dark blemish upon the otherwise glorious legacy of Henry V. Only a select few managed to survive. Among them was such a prized individual as Duke Charles of Orleans, the grandson of the French king Charles V, known as the Wise, and the father of the future monarch Louis XII. Yet, this distinguished member of the Valois dynasty was destined to spend a full quarter of a century in captivity. The reason was that there simply was no one available to pay his ransom. The avarice of the English would not permit them to release Charles of Orleans without receiving compensation. Hence, an intricate plan was devised. The Duke was wed to Mary of Cleves, and the ransom for his freedom was extracted from the dowry that accompanied his bride. Interestingly, by the time of his return to his subjects in Orleans, it was discovered, much to their surprise, that he had a poorer grasp of the French language than of English, which had become like a mother tongue to him during his protracted period of imprisonment. The last major act of ransom during the Hundred Years' War occurred in the year 1430. This time, it was the English who paid out the money. They expended 10,000 livres, the equivalent of 80 kilograms of gold, to procure Jean d'Arc from the Burgundians. This transaction, too, stands as a singular event in the history of the era.